Try to imagine an apple in your mind. Close your eyes and picture it if you can. Here's the test. What color was the apple? 99% of people can answer this question, but about 1 in 100 don't have an answer. They didn't see anything. They might have thought of the concept of an apple, but they don't make visual images in their mind. It's a condition called aphantasia, and it might help scientists figure out how the brain produces conscious experiences. Aphantasia was described in 1880 by Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, a famous statistician and eugenicist. He didn't coin the term aphantasia, that was 135 years later, but he did coin the term eugenics. Galton found that a lot of scientists have aphantasia, which surprised him. Don't scientists have to manipulate stuff in their head a lot? That question is the key to why aphantasia could be so useful for consciousness research. To see why, here's another test. Are these the same object? How about these? There's a classic study showing that the more an object is rotated, the longer it takes you to figure out if they're the same, which is evidence that people actually rotate the object in their minds to solve the problem. A recent study of 95 people with aphantasia showed that not only can they do this mental rotation task, but aphantasics also take longer when the object is rotated more, just like people who actually see the object rotating in their mind's eye. Aphantasics seem to have some non-conscious way to represent and manipulate 3D objects in their mind. In science, it's important to isolate your variable of interest. But when people study consciousness, it's much harder to separate the phenomenon of interest, the conscious experience, from the ability to do something or to act on some perceptual information. That's why aphantasia could be so useful for studying consciousness. It's a case where you seemingly can separate some ability or behavior, like mental rotation, from the conscious experience that usually comes along with it. One scientist using aphantasia to study consciousness is Dr. Hakwan Lau. He's been a vocal critic of consciousness research, most vocally about integrated information theory, IIT, as one of the main authors of an open letter calling it pseudoscience. But he says all the most popular theories of consciousness are missing the boat and not really testing their theories because they ignore things like aphantasia. We start by talking about two different ways people use the term consciousness, how researchers in the field conveniently get them mixed up, and how aphantasia research can help clear up the confusion. What is consciousness? In the everyday usage of the term, it, it just means being able to respond meaningfully to stimuli, right? So being able to respond to external you know, stimulation. So, so when we say people are conscious, it just means that they walk around and they behave in a kind of reasonable way. And then when someone had too much to drink and lost consciousness, that just means they lost the ability to respond meaningfully. I think that's usually what it means in, in the everyday usage of the term. And, and I think in some branch of social science, it continues to be to, to use to be used that way. Consciousness just means a rational uh, realization of your situation to be in and stuff like that. But in this field, in the neuroscience of consciousness or in philosophy of consciousness, I think decades of work or even longer, the philosophers have convinced the scientists that we should really be focusing on the, the, the qualities of subjective experiences. So even simple experiences like just seeing red, the redness of red, the, the painfulness of pain, and we should be focusing on those things and try to explain how the brain you know, could give rise to these kind of nebulous uh, subjective qualities. So the two things are very different. So one is the everyday usage about, of being able to respond meaningfully to stimuli versus the other one, which is the subjective qualities of experience. And, they're very different and the latter is supposed to be the theoretical target. And in fact, we focus on the first one only to the extent that we want to make sure we are not inadvertently lumping it together. Uh, so the, the first one is supposed to be a confound or something that we are, we are not supposed to be confused with. So I don't know how it happened though that in the field now, I think we are in the business of actively forcefully con confusing the two of them. Uh, you can see that the evidence that supports theories usually come from the first notion, uh, even though the theories are advertised as about subjective experiences, the evidence they would take as in, in the favor are usually concerning just the ability to respond. Um, and I think it's really 
bad situation to be in. I mean, the philosophers should be calling us out, but they, they are not. Uh, they Somehow we are in this weird situation where everyone is doing something that is conceptually clearly directly against everything we said we would do. There's a group of people that's gotten some media attention recently, uh, a condition called aphantasia. And this, um, it sounds like, might be a case where we can dissociate the behavior or the ability to respond from the actual subjective experience. Um, can you explain what aphantasia is and why that might be a useful tool for consciousness science? Yeah, the notion has been around for a long time in the literature, but nobody really took it so um so seriously and then made it so systematic and really thank to Adam Zaman who uh, coined the term aphantasia I think about a decade ago and the idea aphantasia you know it's all these like Greek Latin roots that I that I don't fully really know but it comes but it basically means the lack of uh, uh, imagery the lack of mental imagery so you have these people who um, it's about 1% of the population of people. So it's quite common. In fact, some of your audience might right now be realizing this for the first time, that for most people, when you ask them to imagine, let's say an apple, then they would do that. And then if afterwards you show them two apples and ask them, well, which shape, which, uh, which, which of these two apples look more like your apple in your, in your head in terms of the shade of the color or the, or the shape or the size. And then people can usually say, well, the apple I imagined was like, a, a more closer to the one of the darker shade or the lighter shade. But then about 1% of people just cannot do that and they will find it bizarre because when they imagine an apple, it's just a concept of an apple. There's no detailed image in the head that you can actually compare with the with, with actual seeing. Um, and then it's not just that they don't spontaneously do it, but even if you encourage them to do it. So now try to in, in, imagine an apple as detailed as possible. They would still say, I don't know what you mean. Uh, so it turned out it's not that rare. One in a hundred is, is, not, is not super rare. And, uh, and, and you might think that these people just have no mental imagery, which is what the phrase suggests. But I think it's becoming clearer um, that, at least to a lot of us who interpret the literature this way, I think these people does not lack mental imagery. What they lack is the conscious experience of mental imagery. So it looks like that they can actually activate the visual cortex they can do imagery tasks, they can do mental rotation, uh, they can do working memory, they can remember things. It's not like they cannot hold it in their mind. It's just that while they're holding the image in their mind, they are not consciously experiencing the image like most of us do. So, so that's another case where the, the, the impairment or the, or the, or the lacking is, is very selective. It's just the subjective experience that is lacking. It's not the general ability that is lacking. So that's very useful. When I first heard about aphantasia, I was wondering if maybe I have it. I feel like I have a really faint mental imagery. But when when you did the test, I was like, oh yeah, well it was still, it was a round one. It was pretty red, maybe a little bit yellow, and it was was more vivid than than some people get. Um, but it's been a lot of studies on mental rotation. Um, mm -hmm. showing that um, the amount of time it takes people to, to rotate an image or to like navigate to a space on a, a map that they're imagining um, suggests that people are actually picturing it in their mind. So when, when people, people with aphantasia who you tell them to imagine an apple and they just think of the concept, there's no picture at all, um, how do they do on tasks like mental rotation? Do they need that imagery in order to accomplish the task? Yeah, that's, a, that's the amazing thing. They turn out to do exactly like we do <laughs> maybe a little bit some of them might be a little bit slower i mean the, the the evidence is not so um it's not a lot of evidence yet but to the extent that they've been studied clearly the people who claim to have no imagery whatsoever they can still do mental rotation tasks so let's say you just hold an object and then and then ask them well can you look at it and then close your eyes and mentally rotate it by 90 degree and then i show you a new new object and say whether it matches so you can make them do tasks like that where there's a kind of ground truth objective as to whether the answer is correct or incorrect. Um, and then they they would do the task just like we do. They would they would be able to do it and they would exactly the long the, the more the rotation, the longer, the longer reaction time it takes. So suggesting that there's something in the in the head that's like an image that really rotates. Uh, but it's just that during doing that they said there's no there's no experience of rotating the thing. They just somehow can do it.
Interesting. So that, that seems like a pretty clear case where we can dissociate the ability to do something mentally uh, versus the experience of that thing or of, of doing that thing. And, and that makes me think about the hard problem of consciousness where there's a, a question about with, you know, we can, we can talk all day about what the brain does and how it accomplishes certain behaviors. But um, at least a lot of people would argue there's a fundamental mystery about why any of this thinking or doing or seeing is associated with a conscious experience. You could imagine a robot with a camera that does stuff but it doesn't feel like anything. Um, so um, is that a, a decent summary of the hard problem? Do you have a take on whether it's it's a real problem or just kind of an illusion of the way we think about consciousness? I think the hard problem has kind of evolved over time because different people <laughs> read read the original formulation differently and, and took what they can get out of it. But I think maybe one thing that would be helpful since we just talked about the empirical cases. So I'm a scientist. I who dabbled in philosophy. But I think before we go so deep into the, the philosophical notion of hard problem, I think just contrast it with some cases where uh, a visual manipulation that is very popularly used in the literature actually does not selectively impair subjective experience, but actually also impairs the ability to respond, right? So let's say we can start from uh, anesthetics. So if you anesthetize someone, yeah, of course the subjective experience of seeing is gone, but, but basically, much of cognition and, and thinking and responding and all this ability is also gone, right? So that's why blindsight and aphantasia is so interesting. Why this is related to the hard problem? The hard problem is about the fact that there seems to be some subjective experience that doesn't correlate with your ability to, to uh, respond. So that's the original philosophical um, conundrum. And basically in Dave Chalmers, I think 19, 96 book, he tried to make these cases about you can imagine a, a zombie that, that behaves just like we do, but lacks subjective experience. So a lot of it is just armchair philosophy uh, done very nicely, I would say, by, 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 by standards of philosophy. But I find it more useful to think about empirical cases. So zombies, who knows whether they exist, right? Or maybe, maybe just the way that we think that, that allow us to think about zombies. So maybe that's on us. It's not about the universe. It's not about... It's, Going from what you can imagine to metaphysics is a well-known, dangerous, slippery slope, if not a downright problematic approach, right? So because our imagination could be problematic or limited. So I can imagine, because I'm not very good at math, I can imagine the, the square root of 124 being uh, 7 or something. I can imagine it being true because I'm so bad at arithmetic, but obviously it's not true, right? So what you can imagine does not necessarily tell you what could be true or not true. So there are these standard problems that, that I don't want to go into. Uh, I think it's fun to do philosophy, but, but if you have an empirical case, then you really have a case there that sometimes subjective experience can, can go without, um, without the, the ability to respond, and sometimes it does. So you want to understand what, what are these mechanisms, right? Let me see if I've got this right. So if you wanted to study consciousness and you say, hey, let's measure the brain when somebody's under anesthesia versus when they're awake. Yeah, of course, you're going to see huge differences because when they're under anesthesia, they can't experience, they can't do much of anything. You ask them to get up and walk around, they can't do that. Um, so is it the neural correlate of getting up and walking around or is it the neural correlate of consciousness? Well, we can't tell with that experiment, but if we can selectively manipulate the ability to respond or whether an experience is happening, then we can really separate these two and see which which of these things is really about consciousness and which of them is just about some confounding variable, something else going on in the brain that's not really the consciousness that you mentioned at the beginning as being the the subjective experience, the part that's really of interest. Yeah, so I think that's exactly right. And, and, and that is very much in the spirit of the heart problem in the sense that you want to isolate subjective experience as much as you can while it's still, still within empirical science. So within empirically actually happening cases, find cases where subjective experience can be abolished without much of anything else being abolished. So, so that's why aphantasia and blindsight is so cool because the ability to respond seems to be still quite intact. And, and you find these cases, I, so in the, in, the, in the zombie case, you really want to find pure removal of the subjective experience and nothing changes in functionally they may i think there are even like cases where that you're invited to imagine like molecule by molecule duplicates of you that the lacks qualia so those are whatever i feel like maybe maybe you can imagine them but i want to find actual empirical cases right so i think 
to the extent that you're still constrained or, or interested in empirical science, then blindsided and aphantasia are kind of like the almost near ideal zombie states yeah, that would give rise to the, the formulation of the heart problem. Yeah, we uh, we have a kind of zombie mental imagery, and that's the point where it gets really interesting because we you know we can do more than just uh, speculate about what might be going on. Well, when you paint the distinction like that, it seems maybe not easy in practice, but at least pretty simple. Like you have some cases that would be really good cases for studying consciousness. So why hasn't the field taken this and and run with it, and why haven't we cracked consciousness already? Um. For a long time, I thought it's just that um, science takes time, um, and uh, you know some people acknowledge the issues. So I actually my I've been raising these issues for two decades. So the fact that the the, the studies with, that we use are highly confounded. So take for example global workspace theory, which I think is fair to say it is the dominant. Most, one of the most respected theories even amongst researchers. But basically all the evidence come from these highly confounded studies. So when, when people review global workspace theory, which is just the idea that when you're conscious, you're, you're, uh, the relevant brain information in the brain becomes globally broadcasted, it kind of shared amongst many different brain regions and systems. And where's the evidence? Well, a lot of it come from patient studies of coma and and anesthetics. Um, so those are highly confounded and you will see why it would support something like global workspace, right? So because having information globally broadcasted seems to be very good, seems to be a very good thing to have if you want the brain to function effectively. So when you compare a effectively functioning brain versus a completely shut down brain, of course, yeah, you, you'll find a difference will be in global broadcast, some difference will be in that. And then the other evidence will be from backward masking. When you do backward masking, you're not just abolishing the subjective experience of seeing, you're abolishing perception, basically. Uh, so again, if you have a lack of perception, yeah, maybe perception requires some global broadcast, but it may not be subjective experience per se that, that really requires it. So I think the issue is those theories somehow become quite dominant, uh, and then it, they have taken the life of, of their own, on their own. And if you um, if you try to challenge the, the empirical evidence as confounded, you're effectively challenging the theory. And I think the theorists and the people who, are, who feel loyal to the theory will start to defend and say, well, these, these, exper these evidence is fine. I think obviously it's not. I, I, when, I, when I try to explain, I used to teach in a public school as well. And when, I used to, when I teach undergrad, I find that it's much easier to convince them, convince them that there's a huge problem in using these kind of confounded evidence to support a theory. But because I think the reason is they are not already invested into the theory. <laughs> I think if you are the more invested you are, you want to defend the theory. So pe some people would say that these confounders talk about are not real problems. They would say, I'm just asking for something ridiculous. Like they would say like, you're basically asking for something like, uh, you're trying to measure how tall people are and you want me to control for uh, how heavy they are, which is fair. So you can control for tall people that are not particularly heavier. But I say that there's something you cannot control for, like the length of the bones. You can't say you want to you want to compare tall versus short people while controlling for the length of the bones. It's like this is just ridiculous because being conscious. So the the, the, the analogy being that height is, the, is you know is is kind of constituted by your, the length of your bones. So you can't you can't sort them out. Um, and they would say so. Likewise, conscious being having subjective experience is being able to respond meaningfully to stimuli. You can't control for them. So people would say that. Um, and I think it's obviously wrong <laughs> because of cases like aphantasia and blindside showing that empirically they can already be dissociated. So clearly the two things are not the same. I mean, I demonstrated to you how you could control for that. So you should, but people don't. Um, I think the, the, the dominance of theories and, and where theories have been taking on lives of their own is partly to blame. Subscribe to I'm Curious for more clips and you can support the channel on Patreon. Thanks for watching.